I'm so glad you found your way here either this evening or to the recording. Um, we'll be discussing that Evening Sun, a short story by William Faulkner. I have a qualified warning if you haven't read the story yet. The warning is that I'm sure we'll spoil the story and its ending, but uh, the qualification is that I don't think we can spoil it really. The ending is very ambiguous. You'll have to interpret it for yourself. And um, I think the the suspense discomfort that builds along the way is as effective after reading the story many times as it is upon first read. Uh, if those who are with us live tonight, if you've read any work by Faulkner before, why don't you tell us in the chat kind of what you've read and, and what that experience was like for you. Uh, we hope to hear from you all that are with us um, in the chat. So please put any questions and comments um, as they occur to you for everyone to see. I'll try to read your thoughts and questions aloud for Dr. Yarbrough. And we're eager to hear from everyone. We're honored to have uh, Dr. Scott Yarbrough with us from Charleston Southern University, where he is the VP of Student Success and a professor of English. He earned his PhD in American literature at Alabama, where he focused on the novel American literature, modernism, and Southern literature. He was the 2008 South Carolina Arts Commission Prose Fellow and was the president of South Atlantic Modern Language Association in 2017. All to say, no one better to guide us through this story tonight. Um, so thank you so much for being here, Dr. Yarbrough. And the screen is yours. Thank you very much for having me here. I, sh I should, in uh, the interest of full disclosure, add that I did write my dissertation on William Faulkner as well. So I'm, I am a bit of a plant, I guess, when it comes to that. So I will share screen here and make sure that I'm putting the right one on the screen for everyone else and we can start looking at our powerpoint as we go along here Alrighty, and this i think trying to get back where i can see the chat menu but it's not letting me do that so we'll just we'll just go with the screen sharing on this and all that so faulkner is born in New Albany, Mississippi, but from the time he's very young, is being raised in Oxford, Mississippi. And he lives there with a few short stints in other places for most of his life. He was very much interested in and disturbed by and uh, curious about the loss of the Old South, although his point of view of that changed drastically from the time he was very young to the time when he began his writing career. He had a great grandfather who is his namesake, who was a Civil War colonel, and who also began publishing a few novels of his own. They were all what we might call Southern romances. So Moonlight and Magnolias, kind of gone with the wind without any of the questioning parts or the tough parts where everything was great in the old South and slaves were happy and it was kind of a idyllic paradise before the battled war ruined it for everyone. His grandfather and family had always added the U in, and for some reason over the next few generations, they dropped it and went to phonetical spelling. But Faulkner, uh, from the time he pretty much gets to be a young man, decides to add the U back to it, which made a lot of people think he's putting on airs. So World War One breaks out, and Faulkner had not been a very good student in high school, and many of the young guys of this generation just did not understand how horrific World War I was. And of course, the United States was very lucky in that it was fought abroad in Europe. So he and a buddy went up to Canada, convinced the Canadian Air Force that they were of British descent and had British national, uh, uh, were a British nationality and tried to join the RAF, except he was not a great pilot. He had to keep repeating phases of it. And the war ended before he could ever graduate, but he still bought an officer's uniform and a cane. And when he came home to Oxford, he would walk around with a limp and tell, and people would say, were you wounded in the war? And he'd say, oh, I don't want to talk about it, but he implied all over the place he was. And later he would tell people he drank so much because he had a plate in his head from his war wound. So he was always fixated on this and it's 
funny how this story kind of lingers around with him for years. He quits telling stories later, but it still comes back on him a little bit. So he tries to make it as a GED type student at the University of Mississippi. But again, he only goes to classes he likes. He does okay in French and literature and uh, poetry classes, but he simply doesn't go to math and science and things like that. And he's pretty much flunking out when he moves to New York because he knows by now he wants to be either a poet or a novelist. And New York seems to be one of those cities you move to when you're interested in that kind of thing. So he, he moves to New York where he's very much known for not being a, a good clerk. And he would tell people, don't read that trashy book, read Dostoevsky or something like that. But when he uh, later decides to move to New Orleans, what's important about that is that the, his boss from the bookstore in New York has married the now famous writer Sherwood Anderson. And Faulkner thought, saw this as a way to have a mentor in writing, someone that might help him get it published. Now, Anderson was, didn't, wasn't necessarily all that friendly to people. And it's really strange that although Anderson's star has dimmed, he is one of the main reasons the two most significant 20th century writers from an American standpoint, Ernest Hemingway and William Faulkner, he kind of helps both of them get a foot in the door. Both of them kind of would mess with him and, and break with him later. And part of it's because uh, Anderson loved to lord it over them and they didn't necessarily like it, uh, but it still probably wasn't fair how they treated him. But Anderson did, even though he wouldn't read the books, he did show them to his publisher who published his books. Now, if you, if you think about this first book, it's about a World War I pilot who loses his brother in the war, kind of has PTSD. It sounds a lot more like a Hemingway kind of novel. His next book, Mosquitoes, is about a houseboat that breaks down out on Lake Pontchartrain and all these people having romances and flings and breaking up with each other and having affairs. That sounds much more like a Fitzgerald novel. And neither one is really in Faulkner's writing what he's about. But Anderson gives him this advice of write about your people, where you come from, what you know. So in, in Faulkner's famous discussion of it, he calls it his own little postage stamp of native soil. He'd write about that instead. Now, I usually won't read everything I've put on these slides since most of you know how to read for yourself and can always go back to it if you need to. But So he invents the fictional county of Yachnoptafa County, and it's based on the real Mississippi County, Lafayette County. Uh, most parts of the U.S., we might say Lafayette, based on George Washington's uh, buddy, the French general who came and helped out so much, the Marquis de Lafayette. But uh, in, in Mississippi, in that part, they call it Lafayette County. And the county seat of Jefferson is based on the town of Oxford, Mississippi. Now, he has Oxford and Lafayette County be other places when he writes the stories. But most of what he wrote from here on out is all set in this one county. And characters over these many novels interact with each other. They're portrayed one way in one book and from a different point of view portrayed another way in another book. And it has a, uh, it's an amazing interwoven created world here, if you will. You think about how much we talk about Tolkien or other fantasy writers and how they create their own world. And of course, Faulkner's drawing from real life in a way, and that this is very much like the Mississippi he knows. But it's an amazing construct that he uses here for his fiction. And it has a lot of, of influence on other writers to come. This time period from 1929 to 1942 is more or less unheralded in literature since the days of the English Renaissance. So Shakespeare does something like this. It's hard to think who else matches this output in that short period for sheer quality. So it, it, I don't know if it shows up that well in the slide, but Sound and a Fury, As I Lay Dying, Sanctuary, Light in August, Absalom, Absalom, The Hamlet, and Go Down Moses are all bold because those are kind of greatest hits in a way. Great, amazing novels. That's an amazing career by itself. And he still has another 20 years left in him at this point. And it's just early on, of course, he's turning out these incredible books, getting amazing reviews and great magazines, but no one's really buying them. So he's very much seen as a writer's writer and the critics love him but readers find him challenging and difficult. 
So to make money, he goes to Hollywood. And out there, he uh, participates as a script doctor and a co-writer on with, for for my argument, one of the greatest directors of the 30s and 40s, so what we call the classic age of Hollywood, and that's Howard Hawks. So he works on The Have and Have Not. It's a famous Bogart and Bacall and the lines, you know how to whistle. Don't you just put your lips together and blow? Well, that's not in the Hemingway novel. This has very little to do with the Hemingway novel. It is instead something that uh, Faulkner and his co-writer, Lee Brackett, who would later go on to be a co-writer on The Empire Strikes Back, by the way, if you like the kind of uh, great sardonic uh, back and forth you see of Bogart and Bacall, you see later of Han Solo and Princess Leia, and she's your through line there. He works on the great mystery film, The, back, the Big Sleep, classic noir based on Chandler. But he wasn't happy out there, but it did pay the bills. And it also kind of took the reins off in terms of drinking and, and things like that. So he's ignored until, in fact, when The Portable Faulkner is published, which is kind of a series of excerpts and short stories in 46 by a famous editor, Malcolm Cowley. Only his kind of crime novel is still in print, but 1949, he wins the Nobel Prize. So everyone else in Europe, if not the United States, is paying attention to him. And this makes him more of a household name. People start paying attention. All the books go back in print. And you see his, his poetic style here. This is widely seen as the greatest Nobel Prize acceptance speech ever. And he was kind of sick when he gave it. They couldn't hear him that well. It wasn't a big deal the night of. When the speech was published in the newspapers, it became a worldwide and sensation was republished everywhere. But we hear that the, when the last ding-dong of doom is clanged and faded from the last worthless rock hanging tideless in the last red and dying evening, even then there'll be one more sound that of his puny and exhaustible voice still talking. I refuse to accept this. I believe man will not merely endure, he will prevail. And there's more of it here. And he talks about the goal of the poet, which is to say a writer who's writing for art rather than commerce, need not merely the record of man, it can be one of the props to pillars to help him endure and prevail. So that'd be well worth your trouble looking up sometime to just see what Faulkner's about there. So what does he write about? Well, he writes about how, particularly in the South, we're like the ghost in, in Scrooge, Marley. We carry the chains we wore in life around with us. We drag the chains of the past with us in the South for so long, both from the standpoint of the people who over romanticized the past, the people who were so angry at the crime and horror done to them, say descendants of slaves in the past and who can't uh, let it go. The, the people who feel shame and anger and guilt over what happened, we drag our past around with us. He writes about this, this famous quote, that was quoted by both uh, the Obama uh, campaign and the McCain campaign in 2008, I guess it was, when they're running against each other. The past is never dead. It's not even past. Then one of his other most famous quotes, when we think of a young man of a certain sensitivity, of a certain willingness to be worldly, to understand things from different perspectives, you know, how would he feel about everything going on in Mississippi in the 1920s and 30s? Now, to put it into context, for example, you had 800 lynchings between the Civil War and 1960 in Mississippi. So there is an occasionally people think maybe the lynching thing has been overreported or over people make a bigger deal of it than it is. You really can't do that where Mississippi is concerned. It really was a pretty bad situation. So how would you feel about that? Where on the one hand, you're this amazing artist. On the other hand, you're homeland a lot of the people who were like you were doing some pretty bad things so we have his character quentin compson the college student version of the boy who tells this story i don't hate it quentin said quickly at once immediately i don't hate it i don't hate it he thought panning in the cold air they are new england dark i don't i don't i don't hate it i don't hate it from absalom absalom so clearly he doesn't hate it but clearly part of him kind of does and in that constant tension and stress between those two points of view is where Faulkner's characters often live. And he writes about race, so much so that Richard Wright, a Black American writer, said Faulkner's our most important Black writer we've had. Now, 
what's interesting about that is Wright was black, but Faulkner, as you see from the pictures, is a white guy. But what Richard Wright means is he deals with matters of race very straightforwardly without prettying up one side or the other, without angelizing one side and demonizing the other. But he uses real characters and real conflicts. So when the men that have different blood in them stop hating one another from the wonderful novel Light in August. Now, part of this does mean, as he deals realistically about race in the South, in stories that are mostly set from around the time of the Civil War, and in some cases a little bit before the Civil War, up through, uh, you know, things set during his contemporary age. And so I think the latest of his stories is probably set in the 50s, uh, chronologically set in the 50s in, in his novels, is he does have those characters speak realistically. And they will use racially pejorative language as people did and in some cases still do. I would argue that although it's regrettable at the same time, how do you realistically deal with place and issues of, of these times and circumstances if you don't have people speak the way they did? He never again romanticizes or demonizes people due to their race, but he has full fledged, fully rounded characters in those cases instead. So in terms of his style, he's, he's what we call a high modernist. And that means a lot of his writing is very dense, very complicated. He's influenced by James Joyce. He uh, is doing a lot of the same things Virginia Woolf does. She's not too far ahead of him when she starts publishing, but I think she probably has a little influence on him too. So he uses stream of consciousness, complex use of symbols, those things. He didn't follow the kind of modernist themes of everything now is falling apart and the world's ending and we have uh, superstition instead of faith and lust instead of love, those kind of things that show up in Hemingway, Fitzgerald, T.S. Eliot. His themes are his own and they're about the South, particularly as we talked about. But stylistically, he's very much that high modernist. And you see it in that poetic, discursive voice. And by discursive, I mean, he'll in a few cases have a, a sentence which runs on, and it's not a run-on sentence, it's grammatically correct, but it will go for many pages. And often you'll have a full page that maybe is a sentence or two. And that's just part of the complex modernist style that you compose something dense and, and really pressurized, if you will, and it pulls the reader in and makes them work at it and they get more out of it that way. So this might be, well, let me, I'll do this page and then maybe we can pause for questions. Like so many other people who came of age during the World War I era and who lived through prohibition, he was uh, had serious alcoholism problems. So that he joins the club of, of John Steinbeck, Ernest Hemingway, Scott Fitzgerald, Zora Neale Hurston, um, Margaret Mitchell, so many of the writers who all came of age at this time. It, it, there was just a somehow prohibition the combination of world war one which leads into the 20s which leads into depression combined with prohibition creates a rampant alcoholism epidemic and it does affect some of his later work and he does die uh, young he has a horse riding accident and never really recovers from it in the hospital because his health then is so sharp uh, so shot th from the drinking now you'll notice that is um, the uh, a fable wins the Pulitzer Prize. This is a World War I novel, and it's by far the worst thing he ever wrote. So the Pulitzer there is really a, we ignored you for many years, now we feel guilty, and you won the Nobel Prize for Literature kind of award. They gave it to that book, and probably they shouldn't have. He also wins the National Book Award for his collected stories. And again, that's a case of you know, trying to catch up for things they had missed before. So at this point, are there any questions? Any things people are curious about or want to ask? I guess I, I have one question before we mm -hmm. dive into the story. Um, I was wondering if you had any sort of practical tips for first time readers of Faulkner that find either the, the discursive sentences you described or another aspect that I think is difficult, can be difficult reading Faulkner is the way he kind of weaves timelines together yeah. very easily. Um, yeah, do you have any 
any tips for re readers not only understanding Faulkner, but then also enjoying those those aspects of his writing too? I think there are a few of the books that are easier to read than others, but are still giving you the full taste of Faulkner. And in a lot of the short stories, such as this short story, he kind of reins things in. And part of that is he's publishing these short stories for money. And if he gets too complicated and weird in a short fiction, he's not going to be able to play some back then. Uh, like like Fitzgerald, for much of his career, he made more money publishing stories than he did novels. Uh, of the of the big writers at this time, Hemingway is one of the few who makes a whole lot with the novels, and he, he does also pretty well with his short stories. So Faulkner, I would say the novel As I Lay Dying, and there's also a collection of Civil War stories that were mostly published in the Saturday Evening Post called The Unvanquished, which kind of forms a bit of a novel, and he it seems at first that he's writing Civil War adventures and he's not really questioning the point of view of the Confederacy that maybe he's buying into lost cause. But if he's digging through to the end, he turns all that upside down by the end of the book. And it's really beautifully written in places. And it's just a really smart book, particularly the last novella that kind of ends it. So I would definitely recommend As I Lay Dying as a great starting place. And that's a story told from something like 19 different points of view you do kind of have one main character, but it jumps back and forth, but it's all first person. So you don't lose track of who's who and the writing is never dense. The words are kind of spread out more on the page because it's all told from these small time Mississippi farmers points of view um, and about a family trying to decide how they're going to bury their, their, the matriarch who's passed away. So those are great starting places, I think. All right, let me, let me move us on into That Evening Sun here. So, let's see. Okay. So, it's published in the American Mercury Magazine and later published in its first collection of short stories and set 15 years earlier. Now, we don't really know when Quentin is speaking. And this is a prequel story to The Sound and the Fury. And also, I should say Absalom, Absalom, which is also a prequel to Sound and a Fury. Uh, in a way, it can't be because Quentin couldn't really look back 15 years later from the age that his character is. But Faulkner often doesn't worry about those little things and stories and books being a little inconsistent. He just hand waves it and says each thing exists by itself, although it's all connected as well. So it's useful from the start of the story to think of about primarily this is a story about empathy and compassion and also those boundaries we put between ourselves and those we consider the other this is something that is taught a lot in literature classes now that no matter what place you live and the way you see the world we now have one we or we often have some groups we consider the other who are not like us they're not the same, so therefore it's okay to demonize them, to see them differently. We can think of numerous examples from the world around us. I live in South Carolina, and although I don't really follow either South Carolina team, I will say that the South Carolina fans see the Clemson fans as the other, and the Clemson fans see the South Carolina fans as the other. And, of course, we have real-world circumstances. We can think of what's going on in uh, the Palestine-Israel conflict right now. As, as a good example. So all this is kind of laid out for us almost immediately, and there's several interesting things going on in those first two paragraphs. Now, the first one, you do just see the quality of, of Faulkner's writing when he talks about how the, the diminishing noise of rubber and asphalt, like tearing silk. So he doesn't see the encroach of the modern world as necessarily good, but we still see what it's like because you have the, the Black women of the community will take in laundry as a way of making money as, as laundresses. And they'll bundle all the clothes together and carry it on their heads, perfectly balanced. Now, he seems to be referring to a couple of different things here. There was a, a famous writer, Rudyard Kipling, and talking about the connection between the British colonies in, mostly in India, but also in, in parts of Africa and the New World as well had a thing they called the white man's burden and white man's burden meant that if you were going to more or less lord it over people like the indians or or african-americans or whomever 
it was your burden to lift them up and educate them and help them achieve a place of equality. But by the time Faulkner's writing in the South, that term had become more racist. And it was more about uh, how, um, you know, white Southern racists felt that the black people were a burden on the community and hurt the community. So he's kind of toying with that idea. And of course, what he's showing is the person who carries the burden are the black people, the, the people who are carrying the burden, particularly this one black woman who's so disenfranchised in every way you can imagine that uh, she's, she feels utterly powerless. We notice from the very start, we have a distinction between it's a white house with a black uh, wash pot next to the cabin door. So we have that that distinction between white and black. We have the notion of this burden showing up here from the very beginning of the story. Now we know that she has, uh, he's kind of referred to as her man and her husband a couple of times in here. And uh, it's referred to as Jesus. Now, I did have a student one time who told me, my teacher said, she, uh, my student told me that whenever it's not our Lord, we say Jesus. And if it's our Lord, we say Jesus. And I had to tell her, well, for an awful big portion of the globe, the word Jesus is the same as Jesus. And it means the same thing. But we know later, the kids don't know if she's praying or referring to her husband. Now, there's some debate, is it a common law husband? or just kind of like a, just a living boyfriend for a long time? Is it, are they actually married? Story is not really clear. Uh, Mr. Copson does say he'll go off and find him another wife, which implies they're married, but some of the other stuff makes you think they're not necessarily. But notice when the kids watch her, she walks down to the ditch of the other side and through the fence. And that ditch shows up over and over again throughout the story. We see that it's a boundary, it's a border, it's a place that crossing over, it means you're going to a new place. It's like they each have their location. They both have these areas where they stay connected, where they stay put. So if she belongs down in Negro Hollow in her house and the Compsons belong in the big house up the lane, they are people who employ servants, Nancy and Dilsey. Dilsey's a character from Sound and the Fury. They are servants. And there's and notice the kids won't cross through the fence or the ditch. And instead of going up to her house and knocking, they throw rocks at the house to wake her up and call her out. And again, you know, what what is that about other than the fact that they don't really connect? Now I asked the question on the first line on this slide, why does she name her partner, her man, her husband? Why why is Falk, why does Faulkner name him Jesus? Well, what I would put forward is the whole story is about empathy. And Christ is defined primarily by empathy. He's done nothing wrong, but he's being persecuted and tortured to death and crucified. And yet at the end of all that, instead of being angry and asking, you know, God to rain down hellfire and give payback for all the harm that was done to him. He says, forgive them. They know not, know not what they do. And instead we see that he exemplifies empathy and compassion. He puts himself literally, if you think of the notion of the Trinity and God in human form is Jesus, he puts himself literally in the place of others. So in that kind of distinction, that's what Faulkner's playing with here by naming the character this as well. And that idea of stopping at the ditch kind of comes out in a different way. Now, we notice that the child, Jason, in the story, he is the villain in Sound and the Fury or in part of Sound and the Fury. Uh, and he's just awful. He's already kind of awful as a kid. Like many children, he has no filter. He's greedy. He's selfish. He's a tattletale. He's always complaining. But also he's defined by two other things. He doesn't ever show empathy. He doesn't, when he finds out Nancy is scared, he never feels sorry for her. Now, th this story is is interesting as we think of it as connected to the sound and the fury because Quentin is a kid who's always trying to make his parents happy and just kind of goes along. Caddy is kind of bold and fearless and is insatiably curious, always trying to learn what's really there. And she's the kind of center in many ways of the sound and fury. And Jason, on the other hand, is always about himself. Notice, though, in, in addition to 
everything else. He's constantly judging people and placing people by race. So if you think about it, no one's born in the womb racist. No one's born into the hospital bed racist, but we learn it somewhere. We learn it somehow. And it's a symbol kind of a fallen world that is so easy for kids to learn this stuff. So by the age of five, he's already constantly using these distinctions. She is not like I am. And he uses his pejorative term because he hears people saying it instead of calling her black or the polite term in the 19 teens would have been to call her a Negro, but he doesn't do that because that's not what he's hearing. Now we also see the hypocrisy of some members of the, the white community. We have a church deacon who's used her as a prostitute and when she accuses him of not having paid, he beats her up. And it's at that point we realize that she's gotten pregnant. It presumably is pregnant from Stovall, but it's, it could be some other person, although she does imply she tells Jesus it's not his, and she implies it's from a white man, and Jesus gets mad. And it's after they throw her in jail and after she's had her teeth kicked out by Stovall, who doesn't get arrested for assaulting her. And she does for accosting him, but there's no violence in her accosting him. It's just embarrassing him in front of everyone. He, uh, She tries to commit suicide. And so notice how the jailer reacts. Is he horrified? Does he put himself in her point of view that she's scared to death of what her husband will do? She's scared to death of having this child. She's scared to death of anything else. Uh, the jailer just says, well, it's cocaine and not whiskey because no N-word would try to commit suicide unless he's full of cocaine because N-word full of cocaine wasn't an N-word any longer. There's an utter inability to use compassion or empathy, relying instead on his his point of view that he already had that he's prejudged. So now the Jesus character in the story is very scary and he's pretty dark. He carries a razor. This uh, goes back to post reconstruction. There were times and places where black men were not allowed to carry weapons around town at all. But if you had a long straight razor, again, don't think of a little shaving razor. Think of those long, scary straight razors. You could carry that and say it was just for grooming. So it kind of became associated with how how black men would would defend themselves or engage in violence. The razor was the uh, the the trope, and I would say stereotype is that black men would use the razor. Um, and so he's a scary guy in the story, and Nancy's petrified he's going to come back and hurt her. It's hard to humanize him and hard to put yourself in his point of view or to see anything that you can understand about him. But of course, when he says this, it kind of puts things in a little bit different perspective. So how is he supposed to feel that on the one hand, his wife has slept with these white men. On the other hand, she's taken money to do so. On the other hand, she gets beat up and thrown in jail for it. And he can't even go after the guy who beat her up because if he does, they aren't just going to beat him up in exchange or throw him in jail. They're going to, they'll, They'll hang him. They may hang him legally through the court system, and they may hang him with the lynching. But he he would be killed for it, probably. So his response, I can't hang around white man's kitchen. White man can hang around mine. White man can come in my house. I can't stop him. And white man want to come in my house. I ain't got no house. I can't stop him. He can't kick me out, and he can't do that. So we see that although he's still a pretty dark, scary, maybe even reprehensible character, Faulkner shows you he's not that way because he's simply a cliche. He's not simply the abusive husband or the guy being mean to his his wife. We see that there's an actual legitimate reason he constructs these ways. Again, it doesn't justify how far he seems to be willing to go, but it does help us understand him. We have any any questions at this point or we're still good? I think we're still good. Yeah. So notice that what Nancy arranges as a defense mechanism is to merge the places, the black place and the white place, the small house down in Negro Holler versus the large, uh, we know from the other books, three-story nice house the Compsons live in on the kind of nice street just not so far away that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a short walk, but it's a different world almost. And so she stays with them. 
when she can because she knows, uh, you know, Jesus isn't suicidal and he also doesn't have an ax to, to grind with the Compsons. So he's not going to come after her there. And or she later, of course, tries to get the kids to go with with her and she gets Mr. Compson and the kids to walk her home. Now, notice one of the times when she, uh, Mr. Compson decides to walk her home and, uh, and to, in some way or another, again, show her a little bit of sympathy and all that. Um, Mrs. Compson is saying things like, I can't believe, uh, you know, you will leave us here alone, you know, leave me here alone and in danger while um, you, you walk, uh, you know, this black woman home. And she has no empathy at all. Now, you got to know, and she's kind of awful in the sound and the fury. She's utterly self-absorbed and everything's about her. She's always pretending to be sick, make everyone feel sorry for her. But she has no compassion at all. She says, I must wait here alone, alone in this big house while you take a Negro woman home. She knows she's not in danger. She knows that Mr. Compson isn't going to do anything untoward. He, he takes the kids with him, uh, in fact. But she still just doesn't want to put out even that much. And again, we see how Mr. Compson and the children go up to the ditch, up to the fence. They won't go past it. And it's only later when she takes the kids all the way into her house, into her kitchen, that he's willing to cross those boundary lines, those border lines. And he is probably the most compassionate white adult we see, but he is, you know, he's a construct of his society. Of his society, it says there has to be very clearly kept color lines and people from well-to-do white families and people from poor black families cannot interact in ways uh, beyond these, you know, kind of uh, employer servant ways and so on. Now we see later when she has the kids there She's trying to entertain him. She tries to read the story about the queen and she kind of gives up halfway through and she knows if she doesn't go into the ditch and that so the ditch is always very interesting. A lot of critics write about it, how it it's like a, you know, it's a descent down. It's a, it's dark. They can't see it. We can almost think of that ditch, not only as a boundary or a border, which it clearly is, but it's, it's dark and murky. It's the unknown future. You know, what will happen to Nancy? What will happen? We, you know, will, is Jesus back? Will he, t you know, take out a, you know, a violent revenge on her? We don't know. But we see that scene where she touches that hot lamp. And it, for those of you who've never seen an oil lamp or kerosene lamp before, there's a glass globe that goes around a wick and it glows. And it's, the amount of light it gives off is not too dissimilar from a kind of low wattage modern lamp but the glass gets super hot so when people want to lift up the glass you know chimney or whatever to blow out the wick uh, or usually they do it by turning the wick down there's a little key you turn that would lower the wick a little bit uh, it's incredibly hot so you have to use a pot holder or a cloth or something to pick it up but she puts her hand on it and kind of lets it burn Earlier, when Jason's in one of his, I'm white, you're black, you're black, I'm white, I'm not black, and you are motifs where he keeps repeating all these things. Um, he asks her, you know, are you black? But he's using pejorative N-word and such things. She says, I'm hellborn. Well, she feels forsaken. She feels damned. And she does say only the Lord knows. And we do see that. But of course, she's someone who's transgressed against society and maybe she feels those sins are not going to be forgiven. She feels utterly bereft of anyone. The only place she can really reach is out to the um, children. Even her mother-in-law is not that willing to help at this point. She seems to be disavowing uh, the Jesus character for being too violent. So he does go back to, um, to get the kids, but he, but Mr. Compson does not bring her back to his house. He could, he could let her come sleep with the kids. He could let her come sleep in the kitchen just for a few days until the crisis seems to be. So is he just not taking, he says a number of times when she's really scared, he says, nonsense, nonsense. He's not taking that seriously. 
So is that showing a lack of empathy? Is it showing a lack of taking her seriously? Is all of the above? I think so. I think he's compassionate to a certain point, but not compassionate enough to challenge the rules laid down by society. Probably something you guys may have had a chance to study before or read before might be The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. And what stands out about that book is that Huck Finn is willing to break free of society by the end and help his friend Jim, the runaway slave. But of course, it's easier for Huck to do so because he's already mostly outside of society. He's a mostly orphaned, uh, redneck, river rat kid, with very little schooling, very little churching. He's already outside society. So breaking away from society, it's not that hard. Mr. Thompson is a kind of pillar of society. Is a, he's an attorney, uh, you know, from Sound and the Fury. He's college educated, all those things. As a, as a pillar of society, it's much harder for him to break away, and he fails to do it. The weirdest thing about the story for everyone is the plot is unresolved. Does he come back and harm her or not? Is she going to be safe or not? We never know. But the thematic arc of the story does complete. The children don't learn uh, how to act. They don't learn instead how to see her. They don't learn. I wrote here in a slide, don't learn manners. What I meant to write, it's weird how that came out. Um, certainly Jason never learns manners. It, it should have been do not learn empathy. Don't learn to show her compassion. They're not required to because she's other than them. She's not like them. And so they will carry these burdens, the sins of their family forward in a way by being another generation to kind of perpetuate these boundaries and borders and ways of kind of seeing, you know, Nancy not as someone to show compassion to and empathy for, but someone to kind of judge and think, well, she shouldn't have shouldn't have been fooling around if she didn't want to make him mad, which is what Mr. Thompson says at some point. So, all right, let me stop sharing here. And I think we're back. So, Okay, great. Um, I think I'd like to start by revisiting the, the naming of the character Jesus again. So it, it makes sense. It, do, it definitely establishes the theme of empathy, like you're talking about. Um, and there is a way in which he's, he's victimized by society. Um, I guess one vague idea I had, especially with the moment where she's touching the oil lamp, I was wondering if that was supposed to evoke the parable of the bridegroom and the oh. virgins with the lamps. But I don't know. I was just wondering if you had maybe more to say about his particular character being the one named Jesus. Kind of what that the, does. One of the things I like to talk about with students, and this this story was removed from the Norton a few years ago, so I haven't taught it in a few years. But and it's a Norton anthology of literature, I should say. So a lot of in colleges where we're teaching these classes, we have to kind of settle on one anthology, maybe a couple of extra books in addition to that. One of the things that it was interesting is my students would always be very uncomfortable with the character named Jesus. But that, of course, is from the English and American tradition, because in French and Latin American countries and, you know, Spanish uh, speaking countries and probably, I guess, in Spain as well, it's very common. So it's particularly a, an Anglo world view that you don't that there's something disrespectful in using the name of Jesus. I hadn't thought about necessarily that particular parable and I kind of have to go back and look at it now to see um I have thought before about Jesus is the way and the light um and the, what it says in the beginning of of John you know he's he was sent to bring a light to men um but that seems to be too far gone from what this character represents which is the dark and the unknown really the opposite of I I guess we could say in some ways he's been harmed and he's going to enact it, it, the fear is he's going to enact payback on Nancy, which is the exact opposite of what Christ Jesus Christ does. But on the other hand, um, it, so he's he's kind of an anti-Jesus in some ways, you could argue, in that case. But it that maybe no more so than the Compsons are. Mm -hmm. He's going to do more deliberate violence, but on the other hand. Uh, they've had no harm done to them and they're not willing to just 
step a little further. He doesn't go talk to the police for her. He doesn't go, um, uh, he doesn't bring her back to the house and let her sleep in the kitchen or in the kids' rooms or anything like that. He very deliberately kind of says, here's the boundaries and we're not going to cross those. You know, society has laid those down. So to, mm -hmm. to me, it, it kind of just shows all, all these people would have been church going people who consider themselves Christians, but how far, how deep into them does that really go? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. If he, if he has a sort of resemblance to Christ, it seems like it would be the Jesus of like the second coming, maybe a more yeah. wrathful version. The, a, a wrathful version. And, and of course there's nothing in a story that would make us think he's supposed to be any kind of literal embodiment of, of Christ reborn or anything. You know, it's not like say the road in McCarthy where the child maybe is supposed to be the new Messiah or something like that. But here in this case, um, you know, he's, it, it's clearly just meant to evoke an idea for us one way or the other. And I think that's what it does. And we see, of course, uh, one of the things that's a little fascinating with the story is that children have no idea what's going on ever. And so we see in their kind of ignorance of what's happening, that's one of the boundaries or borders between them and Nancy, because you have a nine, seven and five year old and caddies. So the discussion about the watermelon and the vine and all that seems pretty clear cut to us. Caddy has no idea what they're going on about. And they can't really figure out why Jesus would want to hurt her or be mad at her because they don't understand what happened to her with Stovall and perhaps other men. They don't understand that she's been in jail. All those things have been kept. I do find it interesting that although she has been, um, she got beaten up down in town and thrown in jail and they know about it, that at the same time, Mr. Compson doesn't really mind. Uh, the Compsons don't mind her coming in as a substitute cook when Dilsey's sick. And it seems to imply that they think, well, that's just the kind of problems that they're going to get up to down in the quarters. And we just don't worry about it too much unless it comes and impacts our life. Mm -hmm. I had a question about um, Quentin. So the narrator and the, the nine-year-old in the very last section kind of the younger two are having their own conversation and Quentin asks his father who will do our washing now and I wasn't sure reading that what Quentin at this point thinks is happening does he think that she's going to die or that she's not kind of hireable anymore for them or that I, that's a really great question. You know, um, Natalie, I have taught this story a lot. I've read it. I don't know how many times. And today, rereading it to prepare it for tonight was the first time that line really stood out to me. So I I thought the same thing. It, it seems to imply that Quentin's old enough to realize she's really in a dangerous position and may end up being killed. And, and he can understand that about her and think of course he doesn't think how horrible for her he thinks who's going to wash the clothes so there's still even if he is that smart that he's figured it out then there's even a more deplorable you know lack of 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 empathy on the other hand if it's more we've transgressed and the rules have been broken we went to her house when we shouldn't have and you had to come get us back you know it may well be thinking well they won't let her come do the washing anymore you know the father said she couldn't come with us so maybe he's thinking of that but it, i think that first reading that you brought up i think is probably the right one and it's fascinating to think he sees that and yet at the same time he's not willing to say to his father we've got to help or how horrible but instead well who's going to do the wash just a practical matter so So the ambiguity of the ending, even the ambiguity of what the the people in the story think is happening at the ending, like Quentin, um, I can, I've started to Im imagine with the help of your interpretation, kind of what effect that's supposed to have on the reader, but do you want to say what you think the effect is supposed to be of that unknown? I. So there's a thing by a famous French critic named Roland Barthes. He calls uh, the pleasure of the text. He goes, why do we 
in, in, in his book on that, he talks about why do we read? What's the pleasure we get out of the text? And he kind of constructs over the course of that pretty complicated book, which I don't necessarily recommend you rush out and buy, but just read a good summary. Uh, he he kind of points out that on the one hand, we read just because we enjoy the getting caught up in the story. But on the other hand, there's another level of reading where we want to figure things out. We want to understand things. And he, he isn't talking about, say, an Agatha Christie or Sherlock Holmes story, it, it, you know, solving a puzzle or mystery. He's really talking about the the actual themes and subtext and those those complex layerings that were guided to through use of symbol, were guided to through complex things happening in the narrative, through characters gesturing toward them. And it's working that stuff out as you become a more sophisticated reader that provides us pleasure. And so I think with Faulkner, he's setting us up to have a pretty straightforward crime story. Right. And not so straightforward that it starts with Nancy's murder and then we go back and find the Jesus character and fill in all the data. You know, it, so it's not written in that kind of way and not even so straightforward as to have some kind of denouement or or final resolution that shows what's happened. But rather, he sets us up for that. And so when then when it doesn't deliver, our immediate question is, well, why? So and I was you had not seen my PowerPoint all the way through. So I was pleased that you brought that up as one of the things that you were curious about, how you know you, the warning you gave to people that the story is not entirely resolved, because that is something, I, of course, that I addressed here in the PowerPoint. Uh, and I think when you are hit at the end, well, we don't know. The first thing you might think is, well, why does he not tell us? And then we start thinking, well, what are the things that are peculiar in here? All this about the ditch, naming a guy Jesus, that stuff with carrying the laundry perfectly on the head at the beginning. What all these clues mean? What are, we we become another kind of detective, and we it's it's more a detection of analysis and a detection of interpretation as opposed to so the clue is not the. Um, you know, smoking gun dropped on the floor next to the uh, perforated villain, but rather it's a, a symbol such as that burden on her head or that character's uh, name. And then we start asking ourselves, why does he make that choice? Because when a writer is is writing, especially if they're trying to write multi-layered, complex literary fiction like this, every choice they make is on purpose. Just like when we choose to write an essay or tell a story, we choose what goes in, what stays out. So I gave a kind of real quick rundown of Faulkner's career in the beginning of this, and I chose kind of what to put in and focus on. There are other things I could have really spent a lot of time on. And if we were, if this were the first week of a graduate seminar on Faulkner, we would have spent, you know, maybe an hour and 20 minutes on what I did in 15 minutes here. But uh, you, you choose what to put in, what what to leave out anytime you're communicating with people and when you're writing with people. And so in this case, we ask ourselves, so why does he make those choices? We're looking for insight. And in modern criticism, we're told there's a thing called intentional fallacy, which is you never really know for sure what the writer intended. Unless I would say that writer is Flannery O'Connor and she writes you all these essays on this is what I meant and how I did it. Uh, when we're very grateful she did that because it helps. But uh, with Faulkner, he's always looking for ways to make things really complicated. Now, your understanding of the story is made a little easier if you've read the other books about the Compsons, for sure. But I don't think it's really necessary. You just see it's just a kind of joy in seeing how evil little Quentin, little Jason is and how bad he'll be later in The Sound and the Fury. Uh, it, but there's not really more understanding that's delivered. But we do see this story just, you know, very straightforwardly grapple with the race of these characters set again at, at least 1915 uh, or 16 for a story that comes out in 1931, but probably even a little bit earlier than that. And just how unwilling the narrator and his his brother and sister and his parents are at going that extra mile and showing some empathy for Nancy. So. And if you think about stories, if if we think we know there's a long history 
of, let's say you have a battered spouse in the 1930s or 1940s. Now she's got parents or brothers or people who look out for her. Something might be done about it. But we also know how often law enforcement didn't take it seriously, weren't concerned about it. Domestic abuse was not real crime in their point of view. And that that often sounds crazy to modern listeners, but it it really was a problem, and especially in rural communities. What you know, back in those those times. And yet here's Faulkner writing in 1931 who's got all the sympathy for this person who, no matter how you look at a community totem pole, Nancy's on the very bottom, you know, of, of, of men and women, men always are going to have more rights than women at that point in history of white people and black people, you know, the white people are more privileged. Black people have many rights denied to them. This is before all the voting rights and Jim Crow laws change. Um, and then among the black community, she's someone who has transgressed by being a prostitute. So even the more, respectable members of black society are going to look down on her. And then of course um, she's having, uh, she gets beat up and loses her teeth. So she looks funny and she's going to have this child as she lives out of, out of wedlock from someone she doesn't care about and who was, you know, a client it seems. And so in every way imaginable, she's got, she's at the very bottom of the totem pole, the very bottom of society's ladder. And yet he still shows sympathy for her. And that's something fascinating about Faulkner. I don't think any of his peers were capable of this, in, in, including uh, writers like Richard Wright. So. Yeah. I have so many more questions about the details of the, the story. I wish we had another hour. Um, I guess since we just have a couple minutes, maybe I'll ask you what questions does this story leave you with, if there are any? Maybe just question to leave the readers with. Well, for for the readers, I guess the first thing I would say is, if you are interested in how this story kind of sets you up for one story and then it swerves into another kind, you might enjoy the other very commonly reproduced story that is also about the South trying to let go of the past, which is a rose for Emily. And again, there's kind of a dark twist that makes the story very notorious there. And, and maybe just ask yourself when you're reading a, a regular mystery, you know, does it do other things as well? So if you compare what Dorothy Sayers does to what Agatha Christie does, Agatha Christie doesn't ever really question the English class system. She's pretty happy dealing with mostly the upper classes. You never really see the the servants or the the gardener become more heroic. And that's very much a British point of view. Detective, American detectives are the opposite of that. They're challenging the system. They're challenging authority. And that's very much American. For this, for this story though, and for Faulkner, I would say, uh, and I, the other thing I should say is he did write a, a collection of straight mystery stories that are not that complicated. There's like one really complicated story in them. The rest of them are real straightforward. Uh, it's they're all collected in a, in a publication called Knight's Gambit. Um, but the other thing I think I would ask myself here is just, you know, why tell it through the children's points of view instead of third person? What does that accomplish? Why the emphasis on the ditch, as we talked about, that that use of the name and also why choose this, you know, Nancy to make his his character, who again is at the bottom of every way people would rank each other, and you know what does he accomplish with that? So, okay, well, we're on the hour. That's a great place to end. Um, thank you so much. You've been so generous with your your time and your thoughts. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And I hope our, uh, our people watching tonight and maybe the ones who watch it later um, learn a little something and I hope they enjoyed it. So great. great. Thank you so much. And thanks to Charleston Southern for, for sponsoring this event. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.